find our seats and quiet our hearts and our minds. We have a special appraisal today, so we're looking forward to that, but we'll take a moment to get settled in. What a good breakfast that was, uh, by the way. So thank you to everybody who will cook and bring the egg casseroles and uh, provide the orange juice and milk and the coffee and cakes. Following the service, if you want pancakes, there are pancakes to go. So they pay a lot, and they'd be happy to put some in a Ziploc bag for you. Um, there's also uh, a lot of coffee left, so there's some carafes if you wanted to take one home um, and bring the carafe back. That would be perfectly fine. But we will have a little coffee hour here after, after this worship service. Another minute to get
to enjoy your, your music here at our congregation. I know you are in demand this time of year, so we thank you for, for etching out Easter for us, so we appreciate that. A couple of announcements. Uh, the flowers look beautiful, so thank you to everybody who donated those. Uh, they are available to, for you to uh, take home with you today. If you forgot, did I buy a tulip or a geranium, or what did I buy? There's a pink sheet that tells you, so um, so we thank, look at all the people that donated, and look at the beautiful flowers, so thank you for that. And again, they can uh, go home with you today following the service. Like, don't come up here now and get it and take it. <laughs> okay, so, um, a couple of things. Uh, book Club will be this coming Tuesday. We've got moved from last week, and our Tuesday night Bible study will resume on April 16th, so that will be a good thing. Um, we continue with our Monday Bible study on Zoom and our Wednesday in-person Bible study uh, in our uh, conference room. We have a cleanup day coming up um, on Saturday, April 27th, where we'll be doing some spring cleanup around the church. Um, and so inside and out, there is a sign-up sheet out there on bulletin board number two. If you'd like to let us know you plan to come, or honestly, you can just show up and we'll be glad for that. So uh, that is what I know about that. I already announced about the leftover Easter breakfast things. So. I don't think there's no one waving their arms, so I'm going to say there's nothing else I need to announce. So in that, with that, we begin. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We sing our gathering song. <laughs> Thank you. 
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. And by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Make us die every day to sin, that we may live with him forever in the joy of the resurrection. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. The first reading is from the 10th chapter of Acts, beginning with the 34th verse. Peter crosses the immense religious and social boundary that separates Jews from Gentiles in order to proclaim the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, so that God's forgiveness in Jesus' name would reach out to all people. Peter began to speak to the people, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went out about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witness to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with the first verse. The core of the Christian faith and Paul's preaching is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As the crucified and risen Christ appeared to the earliest of his followers, so we experience the presence of the risen one in the preaching of this faith. Now I remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn receive, in which also you stand, from which you also are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in me. For I pass it on to you as of the first importance. What I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins, and in accordance with the scriptures, that he, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom were still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of God, the word of life. Please stand for the gospel.
according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. The resurrection of Jesus is announced, and the response is one of terror and amazement. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. For you are, looking, you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's been raised. He is not here. Look, there is a place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seen them, had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. <laughs> Friends in Christ, people of God, grace and love and life to you from God who raised Jesus, from Jesus the risen one, and from the Spirit of God who raises us all on the wings of power and faith. Amen. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now I know some of you have come to this Easter service from many different places, many different points of view, differing needs and attitudes. Some of you have come this morning because someone asked you to be here. Others have come, excuse me, come out of habit. You are always here on Easter. Still others have come for the music. Or you are in town perhaps visiting a relative who is a member here. But I'm not concerned with that. What I'm talking about is not how you have come into Easter, but the way you will leave Easter. There's more than one door out of this church, more than one way to depart from the cemetery, more than one path from the empty tomb. You see, this is the way the Gospels speak of Easter. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree that it was the women who dared to venture out to the cemetery on Easter Sunday. Three women. It was still dark when they made their way cold through those cold and dark Jerusalem streets, quiet at last after a weekend filled with violence and ending in crucifixion. They risked much. After all, the soldiers who had crucified Jesus, who had been ordered to guard the tomb, well, they might do the same to them as they had done to Jesus. All the Gospels agree that women were the only disciples left after Good Friday. Everyone else was hiding. But even these women were disciples of a dead master because Jesus was dead. So on this dark, forlorn, early morning, three women were out in the cemetery to perform one final act of devotion for their departed master to dress his decaying body with sweet-smelling spice. And when they got there to the cemetery, that place of death, the stone before the tomb had been rolled away. There was a young man sitting in the tomb. Luke says that the two were there in dazzling apparel. Matthew says they met an angel. Mark just calls him a young man dressed in a white robe. So he gives them the news, that startling, unexpected news, that Jesus of Nazareth, he is risen. He's not here. Go, tell his disciples that he's going before you. 
Matthew said that the women ran back into town with great joy and began to tell everything that they had seen and heard. The risen Christ even met them on their way back. Luke says that the women ran back and excitedly told everything to the apostles who considered the women's tale to be an idle tale until Jesus appeared to the men in the village of Emmaus and again at breakfast. You see, Mark, Mark tells this Easter story differently. And perhaps I'm thinking more truthfully. Mark Lee is believed to be the oldest of the Gospels. He ends his Easter story abruptly, even awkwardly, ambiguously, particularly in comparison with the other Gospels. The last words of Mark's Gospel are words about the women. The women who had just seen the empty tomb and heard the words that he has risen, he is not here, he's going before you to Galilee. Mark says of the women, and they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And then the Gospel of Mark ends. Well, that's a letdown. I mean, what an abrupt ending to a spectacular story. Where, where did the women go? Did they ever work up the nerve to tell what they had seen? What happened on, I don't know, Monday? No wonder by the second century, helpful preachers had added a few more verses to the ending of Mark. Your Bible at home might have 12 more verses at the end of Mark, but most New Testament scholars agree that Mark originally ended right here at verse 8. And they went out and fled from the tomb and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Mark tells of no further appearances of the risen Lord, no suppers at Emmaus, no reassuring words to the women on the, back to, on the way back to Jerusalem, no breakfasts on the beach. There's nothing but this abrupt, stunned, stupefied, silent, eerie, fearful ending. They didn't know what to say, says Mark. Words failed them. They felt fear. Now, it would be difficult to write an Easter hymn based on the basis, on the basis of Mark's Easter. You couldn't inscribe these words over the gateway to a cemetery or carve them on a tomb. They felt fear. Yet, they do touch a chord. I'm betting that Mark does a better job of expressing how many of you feel about Easter than do the more elaborate, more refined, assured words of Matthew, Luke, or John. If you want the resurrection explained to you, if you want Easter done in a technicolor pounded into you and sure and certain words of earnest conviction, argued scientifically or evoked poetically with talk of crocuses and butterflies emerging, then forget it. The three women have only to tell, but if you can get them to tell it, of the Easter fear, trembling, and silence. They have come out of the tomb as one, come out to the tomb as one last show of respect for poor, dead Jesus. They have come out to put a few cosmetic touches on a now decaying, perhaps already badly smelling, dead body. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man who said, you seek Jesus? He's not here. He's risen. He's already out in Galilee. Go and tell the disciples that he's gone on before you. But they couldn't obey the directives of that young man to go and tell, at least not immediately. The first thing they felt was fear. They were afraid. And again, Jesus had given them the slip. They had gone out to the cemetery to give them a de decent burial, but Jesus wouldn't stay nailed shut. Some sweet memory. As always, he's gone on before them out ahead of them, into the future, out of death and into life. 
and it scared them half out of their wits. So if we come here this morning as those women came to the tomb, can we come here to pay our respects to Jesus who lived so long ago? Jesus who did and said some wonderful things but is no more? You may have come to nail down your faith, to be reassured again that you are certain. Resurrection, right. You have it all nailed down, secure and certain. No problem. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand and sing the final one. But that's not the way the risen Christ does business. What he offers is not always certainty, but more often awe and stupefied amazement. So Mark never gets around to putting the finishing touches on his gospel. The whole point of the empty tomb is that the story is open-ended. Like the women at the tomb, we see something, we hear something, but nothing's been explained. So we have to decide. He is going on before us. He is not in the tomb. He is out in Galilee. If we come out of the place of death wanting proof, well, we get no proof. What we get is a living, life, living God who is out way ahead of us. And all those well-meaning second century preachers who added those 12 reassuring verses weren't all that misguided because that's what each of us must do with Mark's story of the women and the empty tomb. We must finish the story for ourselves in our lives. We have been told that he's not here, that he will not stay nailed down, sealed up, all tied up and secure. Jesus will not be held by death. So if we would follow him, it, would not, it will not be to places of deadly certainty. It must be forward, into the future, out into whatever Galilee will meet you on Monday morning. That's where Jesus is. That's where he will meet you. And the good news is more than a little scary. So no wonder the last word in Mark's gospel is a word of fear. So what are you supposed to do with this story? Well, that's your problem. <laughs> After all, you're the one that came here looking for Jesus, but he's not here. <coughs> we just missed him. By this time in the morning, he's already in Galilee. He has gone before you. So go and tell. Amen. Thank uh -huh.
confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For our sin and our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need of good news. Holy God, we pray for the body of Christ, the church, where the church is persecuted and protected, where the church is privileged, granted humility, where the church is fractured, healing. Guide us all to embody Christ's love in the world, God of grace, hear our prayer. Life-giving God, we pray for the earth, your good creation. Join our prayers with the branches lifted in praise and roaring waters of new life, that together we may proclaim Easter hope, God of grace, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray for all peoples and nations, free oppressed communities from occupation, exploitation, and abuse. Teach leaders your way of justice. Empower peacemakers and all who work to end violence and strife. God of grace, hear our prayer. Liberating God, we pray for people everywhere who long for good news. Roll away the stones that keep people from living with dignity and wholeness. Breathe new life and hope into people struggling to make it through each day. Be with all who are ill or suffering in some way. We pray especially this day for Audrey, Kathy, Phyllis, Jim, Sue, Reuben, Sharon, Sandy, Cindy, Richard, Mike, Will, Bruce, Keith, Anne, Francis, Margie, Kevin, Dick, Bobby, Jenny, John, Rick, Lee, Billy Jean, Jim, Mindy, Jim, Judy, Ron, Jeff and Judy, Lori, Richard, Randy, Sybil, and Alton, Jane, Mimi, Marilyn, Tim, Jeff, Tony, Pam, Shirley, and Lisa. We also pray for those who have tragically died this past week, the six people from the bridge collapse in Baltimore, and those who were the victims of brutal killings in Rockford this past week. We lift up to you our shut-ins, Ken, Lori, Kit, and Mary, and ask for your protection over those serving in the military, including David, Dylan, Kyle, Matt, Sage, Tyler, Cristiano, Logan, and John. And pray for comfort for those who are grieving the death of Tom Lombardo. God of grace, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for this community of faith and for your spirit in our midst. Meet us at your Easter table and fill us with your wisdom that we may serve and care for others. God of grace, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we remember those who have gone before us in death. 
Renew our trust in your promises that we live with joyful courage and compassion. God of grace. Amen. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love, through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. As always, we continue to be so grateful for your many financial gifts that support the work here at All Saints in our city and around the world. And so I pray. Risen One, you call us to believe and hear bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy.